I first met the ocean as a small boy in the late 1930s. I was being raised by a single working mother. We had three single working mothers and their children, and we shared a house in the Kensington district of Berkeley, California, which is high, uh, sort of the Berkeley Hills. And uh, we had this big picture window where I could look out across the bay. I can remember the ships coming in and going out through the Golden Gate. Even before, the, I watched them build the Golden Gate Bridge. That was my erector set because we didn't have a lot of money to have toys. So I had this kind of virtual erector set of being able to look out through the Golden Gate and watch them build this uh, iconic bridge. But I watched the ships go out and disappear over the horizon. I'd see them come in. And then, of course, the uh, U.S. Navy fleet was based on the West Coast in those days, not Hawaii. It was sent out to Hawaii just on the eve of World War II. So they had these big fleet weeks, and the, you know, the Klieg lights on the battleships would making patterns in the sky, and uh, these wonderfully navy gray, lethal-looking ships that anchor out in the bay. So as, and as I watched all of this, I said, you know, I really want to be a sailor. That's what I want to be as a sailor. I want to go to sea. Navy, maybe, merchant marine, whatever. I just want to get on ships and go places. And I watched those ships disappear uh, over the horizon, going west. And uh, I wonder what was out there. And what's under there? And I've so far, I think I've answered both questions to my satisfaction. Could you say the, sh- the podcast title? Meet the Oceans. Oh, yeah. The podcast title. <laughs> How's that? That's pretty good. <laughs> Go on again. The podcast title. <laughs> My name is Paul North, your host and director of Meet the Ocean. We are a multimedia educational nonprofit with a mission to collect the stories of those who spend their lives interacting with the salt water. Our goal is to gain the broadest perspective of how we live on this planet in order to example how much we benefit from and rely upon a healthy ocean. Today, our guest is a man of great accomplishment, humor, and bold investigation. And if you think that statement contains a little too much bravado, then you clearly have never heard of Don Walsh. Don is an American oceanographer, a former Navy submarine captain, and a marine policy specialist. But what he is most known for is a record-breaking descent into the Mariana Trench on January 23, 1960, in a bathyscaphe named the Trieste accompanied by Swiss oceanographer Jacques Picard. If that doesn't impress you, then consider the fact that he shares the exclusive company of those regarded as ocean elders. Don't fool yourself into thinking that has anything to do with age. Those who achieve such a status have spent their lives guarding the waters of our planet and educating the public on their importance. It is an honor to have Don on our show, and I invite you to listen to what he has to say. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to uh, contribute to this important educational effort that you have invented and are now promulgating. Propagating. I'll take both. Okay. (laughs) So, Don, can you talk a little bit about where we've been and what we've just done over the past several weeks? Past several weeks, okay. Um, Around the middle of last month, I was in Poland and a city called Roślau, which is the old German city of Breslau on the Oder River. And I was there to open a science and technology museum called Hydropolis. You said what we've been doing. Actually, you weren't there. I was by myself, but maybe you were. I, you know, so many people swirling around. How's your Polish? Uh, Mediocre. Okay. Dzień dobry. That means hello, good day. Uh, I know. Jesteś piemkino kobieta. That's pretty good. That means my grandmother wears army shoes. (laughs) (laughs) I, I bartended there for a smattering of days. Okay, good. No, I think you're referring to what we've been doing these two weeks plus the uh, 
regions of the Falkland Islands and, of course, South Georgia, uh, in very diverse natural environments, which I consider to be part of the best of, of being in this part of the world. I, I don't want to say best of being in the Antarctic because we're not really in the Antarctic from a sort of geographic point of view, but uh, the many trips I've made down this way, I always found that uh, Falklands and South Georgia were square foot per square foot more interesting in terms of natural science, political science, that man's history, than uh, large paths of the Antarctic. And, uh, you know, I guess that's w what one might call a qualified answer uh, because in 2002-2003, I circumnavigated the entire Antarctic continent on board a Russian icebreaker, 74 days out of uh, New Zealand. So we saw a lot of the Antarctic on that trip. And so when I make these statements about the relative value of Falklands and South Georgia, it's based on quite a bit of uh, background there. And in fact, I have a, the Walsh Spur named after me near Cape Hallett in the Antarctic for the work I did in behalf of the U.S. Antarctic Program under the National Science Foundation. So I've been at this since 1971. Uh, I don't know if that's germane to your question, but this is my uh, resource that I draw on when somebody asks me a question about how'd you like this, that, or otherwise. And I, it's not ab initio, uh, like we were the last couple of weeks in those two places, South Georgia and the Falklands, but rather based on 45 years of coming to Antarctic places. Five years of coming to Antarctica. Can you even imagine that? Such dedication rivals Shackleton and Amundsen, some of the greatest Antarctic explorers, but they were simply racing to the poles. Don Walsh and his accompanying teams of scientists were studying the depths of the Southern Ocean, truly unexplored territory. And you might think him brave, but sometimes the best careers start by raising your hand to volunteer. Well, it wasn't too brave. I enlisted in the Navy in 1948, uh, and I was in naval aviation. I was uh, in a gunner and torpedo bombers. And I was still in high school, Naval Reserve, Naval Air Reserve. But I was assigned a pilot in an air airplane, and air, you know, I was an air crewman. And I thought, this is pretty neat. I want to get in the front seat because uh, these guys had all fought at Midway and places like that, and they're on the GI Bill at Stanford and Cal Berkeley and so on. And in my squadron that I was in, I can remember early on, they, they had a lot of neat things that they wanted people to go out to the shooting range and you know do this and that, and do I have any volunteers? And I put my hand up and he said, damn it, Walsh, put your hand down. You never volunteer for anything in this man's Navy. Never volunteer. Okay, well, I kept that lesson with me for a long time. But when I, this Trieste thing came up 20 years later, no, 15 years later, I volunteered and uh, got accepted. But the Navy's standards, because they didn't know what it was, they bought this thing, they didn't really know what skills it took. But at that time, I was an officer in the submarines, and I had qualified in submarines. I got in my dolphins, which are the equivalent of wings in aviation. So I was, I was a lieutenant, fully qualified. I was based in San Diego, and this new thing called the Bathyscaphe Trieste that the Navy had bought was brought to the Navy Research Laboratory, actually the Navy Electronics Laboratory in San Diego, because that location was pretty good in that there was deep water offshore, so you could use the full capabilities of the Bathyscaphe. And what they didn't have was some Navy people to sort of operate it, pilot it, and maintain it. The scientific programs that they'd undertake with the Bathyscaphe were all pretty much organized and directed by the scientific staff at the laboratory. But I was uh, on the other side of being the operator. Thank you. 
And so they put out a, a radio message asking for volunteers. And I put my hand up because I thought that'd be a pretty good deal. And it turned out I, I passed their high standards. I was the only volunteer. No one else wanted to do it. Why? Because the Navy's never had a bathyscaphe before. How do you know that's a good career move? Better stay in the uh, you know tried and true normal path. Everybody understands that you do these jobs well, and someday you'll be an admiral or something like that. And the idea of it being something novel or interesting or different was not very appealing to everybody except me. And I, I that's not based on any. Uh, prior knowledge of the program, I had no idea. I didn't know how to spell bathyscaphe. I didn't know what it meant. It just sounded like an interesting job, uh, going deep in the ocean. It was some, somehow deep. I didn't know how deep. Just remember, um, at that time, the submarines we had in the Navy, uh, this is before most of the nuclear submarines came in, our depths were either 300 feet, maximum operating depth, 300 or 400 feet. We call that test depth, and that's the maximum depth you could dive in these submarines that was, was permitted to do it safely. So I, you know, 300 feet was pretty deep for me because I knew that we couldn't go any deeper. That was it, that was the restriction. Uh, okay, so with, with that as a background, I had no idea how deep this thing went, but I knew it was a lot deeper than what I was used to. And I just thought it would be interesting. And so uh, I qualified. the. Navy's high standards for a bathyscaphe pilot, namely nobody else wanted the job. And that's how I got there. I like to say that I passed through batteries of tests like the uh, astronauts and that could leap tall buildings in a single bound and see through steel and all that stuff. But the fact is, that was just, that was the only one they had, so I got the job. And after raising that hand and volunteering, just in terms of a, a time scale from that moment to when you were beginning your full-scale operation, how much time actually passed? Well, it wasn't very long. It was an apprenticeship. <laughs> Here's the background. There were only two uh, deep manned submersibles in the world at that time. It's like there were only two airplanes back in around 1908 or 1905. Uh, only two. So if you want to know all about these devices and how to operate them, how to maintain them, how to design them, how to build them, you could book a restaurant and a hotel for 10 people and you get all the knowledge that exists in the world having dinner together. It's a very small community, very exotic, and, and, and we knew each other. So that um, when I got with the, in with the Trieste, I, I sort of joined that family at the table. It was my first command of the Navy, as it were, uh, being officer in charge of the Bathyscaphe Trieste. But uh, it was something that uh, we learned to do. There weren't any schools to go to, there weren't any books to read. You sort of taught yourself. When the U.S. Navy bought the Bathyscaphe Trieste from the Picards in early uh, 1958, one of the things we bought also was Jacques Picard's time. He joined us as a consultant because at that point they didn't have any um, ownership stake in the Trieste. They sold everything to U.S. Navy. But we hired Jacques Picard, who had been operating the submersible with his father, to come over to the U.S. and show us how to operate and maintain it. So it was an apprenticeship. I mean, I, I learned where everything was because I put on a boiler suit and climbed inside the Vathascaf and helped repair electrical components, the whole thing very hands-on. That's why I say it's an apprenticeship. It wasn't book theory. It was getting there, getting your hands dirty, figuring out how things work, then going out to sea with it, trying it out, and learning how to pilot it. Hi, this is Charlotte Fisher reporting for Meet the Ocean. Swiss oceanographer Jacques Picard was born in Belgium in 1922. His father, Auguste, was himself an engineer and explorer, having twice broken the record for the highest altitude ascent in a balloon in the early 1930s. Together with his father, Jacques built three bathyscaphes that reached depths of up to 10,000 feet. 
Impressed by the work of the Picards, the United States Navy purchased the Bathyscaph Trieste from them and hired Jacques as a working consultant on the Challenger Deep mission with Lieutenant Don Walsh. The goal was to push the limits of underwater exploration. On January 23rd, 1960, the two explorers crammed into the claustrophobically small Trieste and began their descent. It took nearly five hours to reach the bottom, mostly without incident, except that little bit at 30,000 feet where they heard a loud crack. That doesn't sound scary at all. Choosing to continue, the two men reached the bottom to discover what Picard called the snuff-colored ooze at 35,798 feet. That's almost seven miles underwater. And to think, my mom gets nervous when I go in the deep end of a pool. The basic operating principle of the bathyscaph, uh, by the way, that's a, a, a combination of two Greek words, uh, bathy meaning deep and scaphos, boat, uh, which was a term invented by Auguste Picard, the inventor of the bathyscaph. And uh, the bathyscaph itself was, I guess, about 70, 60 or 70 feet long. It was on an underwater balloon. That was the basic operating principle. So as with any balloon, passenger carrying balloon, if you will, it flies in the atmosphere. Um, it had two parts. There was the balloon itself, which was filled with buoyant substance to give you lift. And attached beneath it was a cabin for the more fragile humans. Now underwater, of course, you can't use helium or hydrogen like a, you know, a balloon because very compressible. You can squeeze a balloon flat with your hands, so you can't use something like that underwater. For an underwater balloon, you've got to uh, pick some substance that's solid but lighter than water. Petroleum is lighter than water. Oil floats in water. So our balloon was filled with uh, a petroleum. In this case, it was aviation gasoline, which is universally available all over the world and is a lighter petroleum fraction than, say, heavy fuel oil for a ship or uh, lubricating oil. They all float on water, but for a given volume of that fluid, you'll get more buoyancy out of aviation gasoline than you will, say, of lubrication oil. So we used aviation gasoline. It was easy to get, and uh, it uh, gave us a lot of lift in our balloon. And the cabin that we used was uh, as you might guess, like a submarine, it was a thick wall steel ball. The, the walls of the cabin were about seven inches thick. And there was a viewport in it and, and an entrance hatch to get in and out. So that's basically a balloon. Um, to, to, of course, get it to go down, once you're at the dive point, you have to make it heavier in the water. And uh, while we were towing it on the surface, it weighed 150 tons full of gasoline, so you couldn't just pick it up and put it on a ship. It had to be towed everywhere by a tug. So at each end of the balloon, the balloon itself was uh, sausage shaped, where we, we tend to think of a balloon being a ball, but that's not very good for towing, a good shape for towing. So this thing was more streamlined, like a hot dog with the cabin underneath it. And uh, so at each end of the hot dog was a ballast tank, which while well, you're on the surface is filled with air. And when you get to the dive site, then you just vent off that air. At that point, water comes in, the bathyscaph becomes heavier than water and starts to sink. Okay, now you want to be able to slow down, stop, or come back up. You got to get rid of weight. However, the depths that we were going to in the bathyscaph, you couldn't use compressed air, to, like a military submarine could do, to uh, blow out water and come back to the surface. We had to drop uh, solid weights. And what we had was, say, uh, two containers underneath the balloon, hanging beneath the balloon, that each held eight tons of steel pellets. These pellets are a lot like BBs in a BB gun, about the same size, except those are usually copper-coated lead. Uh, that, that's, that would work for us. So we had these uh, steel BBs, uh, particles. They're, they're used in industrial facilities as reusable sandblast. If, if you want to uh, you know, scale off rust or something, you shoot it under high pressure and it takes the rust off metal and so on. And you can just wash it and use it again instead of using sand. Okay, well, our BBs, 
than uh, the steel particles at the bottom of the, the tubs that held these, they're like cylinders or cans, at the bottom is a funnel, narrow neck. And surrounding that narrow neck is an electromagnet. So that, uh, and, and it's open at the bottom. I mean, if you didn't have the electromagnet energized, all the stuff will pour out. But when you energize the electromagnet, it magnetizes the steel BBs at the bottom of that neck, that funnel, and they can't flow out. It's kind of a magnetic valve. And, and uh, in a case of extreme emergency, you could drop the whole tub. So you had two tubs, eight tons, so you could drop 16 tons right now. So that's kind of how it worked, very simple. And uh, we tow at the dive site, flood the ballast tanks, you start to submerge. Uh, as you go down, if you're going too fast, you just, like little toggle switches, you just push them and you drop a certain amount of shot. You gotta be careful, because you drop too much, then it's the end of the dive, you're gonna come back up. But uh, you know, it's part of the technique you learn when you're piloting the thing. And that's, that's all there is to it. This is Leanna Fisher, mom to Charlotte Fisher, and the official Meet the Ocean mom. By the way, not afraid when she goes in the deep end of the pool, just saying. I'm here with a reading from Seven Miles Down by Picard and Dietz. Chapter One, The Setting and the Challenge. New urgencies are bringing man back to the sea from whence all life has sprung. Clearly, if man hopes to crack the mystery of his murky beginning, he must go back to Mother Sea for the final answers. One day, we may learn that the initial living cell was sparked by the heat from an undersea volcano, rearranging the sea's rich ionic solution. Perhaps the great pressure of the deep was the catalyst in this vital chemical reaction. Few deny our ancestral link with the sea, our saline blood, the salty sweat on a man's brow, the gill slits in the human embryo, all recapitulate evolution and betray man's ocean genesis. Initially, was there a goal depth or was it as deep as possible? And on your actual dive, uh, how long did it take you? Well, uh our job, Jacques Picard and myself, <clears throat> was to act as test pilots. The Navy's Office of Naval Research had purchased this from the Picards as a scientific platform to be used by ocean scientists to do in situ research. In situ meaning inside the ocean, biologists, geologists, and so on. Our job was to prove it out and to learn everything we could about it. It's like test flying a new airplane. We had to find out what works, what doesn't work, any bad habits it has, uh, things that might be unsafe that we ought to remedy. So we had a long period of testing. And uh, by fortuitous coincidence, the deepest place in the world ocean, which is the Challenger Deep, in the deepest part of the Marianas Trench, goes right by the island of Guam in the far western Pacific. And Guam is a major Navy base. So we had a place where we could set up our shop and do our test programs where we're only about 200 miles from the deepest place in the world ocean. So we actually went out to Guam about six months before we did the deepest dive. This was in the middle of 1959. And we engaged in a series of progressively deeper test dives, began the harbor at Guam, a couple hundred feet, and worked our way offshore, testing, testing, testing. And uh, as things broke or didn't work well, fixing them, improving them, adding new equipment. And uh, by the end of 1959, we'd made a dive to uh, about 18 and a half thousand feet. And everything was working pretty good by now. And then after the uh, Christmas time of 59, we went out in January of 60 and made a dive to 24,000 feet. Again, things were working good. So we went back to Guam, did some fine tuning, and on 23 January 1960, we arrived at, over the Challenger Deep and did our deepest dive. The depth was uh, uh, 36,840 feet. 
thirty-five thousand eight hundred forty feet. And well, how do we determine that? Well, we just ran out of ocean. We went down till we landed on the seafloor. We knew it was right about thirty-six thousand feet from scientific work had been done by others. Uh, dive took nine hours. Uh, it took us uh, five hours and some change to get to the seafloor because we didn't, didn't want to hurry things. We we didn't know what was on us. We had no good charts or maps. We, had, we didn't have a depth sounding machine with us. We, we simply didn't know what was under us except that uh, we'd better go down cautiously. And we stayed on the bottom about 20 minutes and spent about three hours and something coming up. Anyway, it came out to nine hours and something total. One of the things that happened on the dive that was kind of a surprise was that as we went down and got to about 36,000 feet, we couldn't see the seafloor. We had a phenometer on board the bathyscaphe which would let us look about 300 feet below us so that we could see the seafloor coming up. We had a graph paper that traced out the depth and we could pretty much see the bottom and as it came up and that way we could modulate our speed and so on to make a slow soft landing. Well 36,000 feet no seafloor, uh, 36,500 feet no seafloor, 37,000 feet no seafloor. So we thought we'd discovered a new deeper hole in the ocean and uh, of course little do we know that when we got back up and reported this, that we determined that the Picards had not recalibrated the depth gauge, which is a direct reading, manometer type uh, depth gauge, and uh, with actually a hose coming through the side of the cabin with that kind of eight tons per square inch water pressure going into this gauge. And they had tested in uh, fresh water, so you're getting salt water inside, fine Swiss instrument and they had not reset the dial and that 2,000 foot difference 37,800 and 35,800 was exactly the difference between fresh water density of fresh water and density of salt water so we had kind of had egg on our face because we didn't know our side Picard knew but he forgot to mention it <laughs> can you talk about the just the human element of what it was like to be down there and uh, which one of you was the, the singer? No, I'm just <laughs> Singer? <laughs> I mean, nine hours, someone's got to hum a tune, right? <laughs> no, no, uh, it was, we were, people say we ever scared or afraid. And uh, uh, my view is if, if you're afraid, then you shouldn't be doing this sort of thing because uh, fright, I think, saps your, uh, your mental acuity severely. Uh, you're on your game and you're, for, and you're up for it. You have run through all the scenarios in your mind and through our testing program we had an idea what was normal, what wasn't. And so again, like a test pilot with a new aircraft, you're all in 10 air out and you're very much alert but you're not afraid. A big difference. So what's going through your mind? Well, what's going through your mind is just continue replaying the scenarios of this is if this happens, then we got to do that, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I don't think there was any contemplating our role in history as we went down. We were just doing the job. And even though it was nine hours, that sounds like a long time. We are pretty busy uh, keeping track of various readings and instruments, talking to Topside. Uh, our communications were not like a regular telephone. I mean, we had no cables or wires to the surface. We were free-floating. But we used to what I call a voice modulated sonar. It's a lot like what you have yak yak and uh, a scuba diving, where you, you can talk to your other diver. There's no wires between you. It's you're you're modulating a sonar, and it's a very low data rate, but you can communicate with people. Well, that's how we communicate with the surface. Uh, we had especially de developed uh, hydrophone that could withstand those high pressures. So uh, no, there was I don't think there was any. Uh, great uh, thoughts as we were going down. We landed on the bottom, we shook hands, told topside where we were, what depth, and then came back up. My name's Sawyer, and I'm five years old, and meet the ocean! 
and this is Sawyer's mama. And today we're gonna talk about the deep ocean. The deep ocean. How deep do you think it is? Super duper deep. What do you think lives down in the deep ocean? Some fish that have lines on their head and it attracts other fish. They say, ooh, why did they chomp them up? And they chomp them up? Uh-huh. Tell me what other creatures do you think you know that might live in the deep ocean? Uh, vampire octopus. Oh yeah, we saw a picture of that, didn't we? Yeah. How deep do you think they live? How many feet down or meters down? Super duper 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 deep. Did you know that some fish in the deep ocean make their own light? No, how do they do that? How do you think they do it? Maybe they get a coral, get a spear, put it on their head, and maybe that's how they make their own light. Oh, they might. Have you ever heard of bioluminescence? No. It's a big word. Bioluminescence. Yeah, that's a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. Bioluminescence is a little hard to understand, but it's also really cool, so it's worth investigating. And in order to do so, I brought on the best oceanographer I know, Dr. Deb Goodwin. Bioluminescence is when living organisms generate their own light through chemistry. It's much like the way a glow stick uh, lights up when its contents are combined. Bioluminescence occurs within light-producing organs called photophores when specialized chemicals react. In most organisms, luciferin molecules interact with oxygen, a process aided by the luciferase enzyme, and light results. Bioluminescence is typically blue or green, although some animals can also generate red light. You can find bioluminescence everywhere on Earth, from mushrooms to fireflies to glowworms on land, but the vast majority of it exists in the ocean, with bioluminescent creatures living at all depths, from the sea surface to thousands of feet down, where no natural light remains. Bioluminescence is especially dramatic in the twilight and dark zones below 1,000 feet. A wide variety of organisms can bioluminesce with different strategies and for many different reasons. For instance, Microscopic phytoplankton, tiny plants in the ocean, glow when they're physically disturbed by waves, passing ships, or even someone kayaking by. Some animals use their light to communicate with one another, perhaps to locate a mate or to alert their neighbors of a threat. In the deep ocean, it's tough to find food, so anglerfish use a glowing lure, sometimes more than one, to attract curious prey, while other fish create a spotlight effect to better see potential food. It's also pretty essential to avoid being eaten. Many bioluminescent creatures produce light to alter their body color and better blend into their surroundings or mimic the patterns of other animals. Self-defense works well too. Both tube worms and shrimp release clouds of bioluminescent fluid that confuse predators, while jellies, squid, and brittle stars may sacrifice a glowing body part to distract a predator so they can swim away to safety. Bioluminescence is one of my favorite things about studying and traveling on the ocean. As Don Walsh traveled by submersible to the deep sea, he no doubt witnessed this incredible phenomenon. So, they reached the bottom. Two men crammed into a submersible. The next logical question seems to be, what did they see? But before we can answer that, we have to ask how they were able to see outside the bathyscaphe in the first place. Keep in mind, this had never been done before. So, to create a window to view what was outside their submersible, potentially risked everything. Yeah, our window was, uh, it only had the inside viewing area where you put your eye. That's just about all you could do, one eye. It was a very small hole. The window itself was acrylic plastic, and it was what we call a truncated cone. It was a plastic cone with one end cut off. Sort of like when you're eating an ice cream cone, you bite the end off, you're truncating that conical shape. So 
to conserve batteries while we're going down, we try not to run the lights, external lights, very much on on the way to the seafloor. We wanted to have, make sure we had plenty of battery when we got there, and and, and for the making those observations. Uh, but but with the lights off, of course, all kinds of bioluminescence as you're going down, and of course the feeling is that they are. Uh, passing by your window from the bottom to the top because you're descending through them. They're not moving. You are. You're going down through them. But if you look out the window, these things are kind of floating up past you from down below and then going by above you. And uh, a wide variety of uh, bioluminescent organisms. And so that's uh, marine life we saw going down. No great fish or squid or anything like that. They probably knew we were there, but we did see them in our limited viewing area. Just before we landed on the seafloor, uh, Jacques, who was piloting us down to the landing, and I was on the pathometer calling off the height above the bottom, uh, said, look, here's a fish. So uh, I went over the window and we saw this, uh, it's like a flatfish, about a foot long, white, uh, flatfish being the same family as halibut, sole, and so on. And that told us a lot, just that one sighting, because it's, first of all, it's a bottom dwelling organism. It's not a pelagic fish that's down there resting or something like that. It lives at that depth. And if there's one, there are others. And it's a fairly high order marine vertebrate. And uh, that it says there's, there's oxygen and there's food and there are others. And after we landed, then we couldn't see anything anymore because we stirred up the bottom sediment, which was composed of a di what we call diatomaceous ooze, which is the skeletal matter of diatoms, very fine. Now, all our dives, when you landed on the seafloor, you stir up a cloud. In a couple of minutes, the currents would move it away, and you could take pictures and all of that. After 20 minutes, we could. It was like somebody painted the viewport white. And there was no perceived uh, change over that time. It's getting better, it's getting better, and so on. It just was the same. And so we couldn't afford more than about a half hour on the bottom. And it was clear that we weren't going to see anything. So that's when we went back up. Uh, too bad. Uh, I mean, it was, it was 20 years later, 25 years later, when the first pictures were ever made. Deepest place in the ocean. That's a Japanese ROV remotely operated vehicle called Kaiko, which is the word for trench. And they could park it down there. They left it, I guess, for several hours. And the cloud did go away, and the Japanese made the very first pictures of the seafloor in the deepest place in the ocean. I regret we couldn't do that, but that was an unexpected situation, and we didn't have a lot of say about it. A reading from Seven Miles Down by Picard and Dietz. Chapter 11, Into the Abyss. For thousands of years, man has looked with wonder at the sea and essayed in a primitive fashion to directly invade it. To say that man has the sea in his blood is no mere figure of speech. It is a simple truth, for the salinity of the blood is similar to that of the ocean owing to our evolutionary kinship to marine animals. With this memory of the sea coursing through his veins, man is now himself on the verge of re-entering the sea. Not as naked man, for with tools he has bypassed the millions of years needed for evolutionary adaptation. Switching gears a little bit, uh, you and I talked about a bit of a vacancy in ocean engineers uh, and some scientific roles. So given your vast experience, I mean, you've, you've been, you've consulted and participated in a vast majority of the deep sea explorations that have happened, you know, over the last... I say only half that. <laughs> okay. Half-assed. So. Okay. Uh -huh. But what... What would you say to people who are either considering working with the ocean or just maybe in general why it's important that people continue the work 
that was started even before you came along? Well, the, uh, I, the basic forcing function is the fact that only about 10%, maybe 15% of the world ocean has been uh, fully explored. Uh, and a time when we're talking about putting a colony on the moon and sending people to Mars and all of that, that's very entertaining. Uh, and, and I'm sure we'll learn a lot, but the basic functions of the planet that we live on, you know, the big man satellite that we call planet Earth, are not fully understood. If we're going to understand our planet, how it functions. We need to extensively explore the largest single object on our planet, namely the world ocean. We're just not doing it. And this means we need to recruit more people in for science. Oh, well, of course, the first thing is public will. Governments have to understand that uh, a mission to uh, planet Earth is a pretty worthwhile thing in space parlance. Uh, but we need to have then be able to staff those kinds of exploration. That's the scientists, the engineers, scientists who do the scientific work, the engineers who build the equipment the scientists need to do that, uh, uh, st those studies, and also to take the knowledge that we've got and convert it into machines that can do useful work for man mankind, like ocean mining devices and such. And uh, right now we don't seem to be getting people into science and engineering like we should. And the Americans have a very unique, you know, let's say North Americans have a very unique capability to conceptualize, to innovate new ways of doing things uh, that many other cultures don't have that capability. And it's not pejorative, it's just that as societies and cultures evolve, they get very good in certain categories of things. In the United States, scientists and engineers are very good at conceptualizing, inventing things. Execution, maybe, we're not as good. I mean, the Japanese can build wonderfully precise, you know, high quality assurance TVs and cars, but the original ideas didn't really come from there. It's they were implementing the original ideas. And so we ought to be doing what we're good at, and that is to imagine, develop things, design them, prototype them, even though they might be built in other places in the world. Uh, and uh, we're just not getting that kind of interest on the part of young people. And, you know, with respect to the oceans, I think it's pretty exciting uh, because with, with only 10 to 15 percent of the world ocean fully explored, uh, your chances as a young oceanographer uh, to make original discoveries really high. I mean, you just have to look for, in, for example, the marine, field of marine biology. You've got uh, these expeditions going out and they're coming back with a whole bucket full of new species, new species, which you could name after your mother-in-law or your sister, something like that. In fact, I know a lady in, uh, in La Jolla, California. She's gotten interested in a certain kind of seahorse, sea dragon, and uh, Apparently, there's one that's got her name on it now. She has uh, resources, and she has put this money in to uh, help people there mount expeditions to do this thing. And as a courtesy, they've named one after her. But as a young marine scientist, you get the whole world as your, your research terrain, if you will. You get to go to meetings in really neat places all over the world. You get to travel in ships and see things that are just marvelous and contribute to mankind's knowledge. How good is that? And, and the possibilities are so high that you, as a new person coming into the field, can make original discoveries and have your name on it. You can't do that on land much anymore. Chapter 11 into the abyss. We have much to learn about the abyss, even though the sea will never yield all of her secrets. It is well that they are closely held, for in an age of certainty and absolute predictability, man's mind would atrophy. If we are to enter watery inner space 
and explore the third surface, we would do well not to do battle with this strange world. Rather, we should enter it with understanding and adaptability, as have the creatures now there. We will not find embalmed cadavers standing erect on the bottom, or discover the fabulous submerged cities imagined in literature. We will learn that the ancients sea of darkness is less fearsome in the light of knowledge. We are prone to speak of conquering nature. If man has a weakness, it is this vanity. The best we can ever hope to do is to understand nature and obey it. A reading from Seven Miles Down by Picard and Dietz. If there's anything you'd like to say, it doesn't have to be in finale, but any topic, any message, any... I think I just said it. You I kind mean, of did, yeah. For encouraging young people to join me. Come on in, the water's fine. I, <laughs> you know, I've, uh, I've, as a kid growing up on San Francisco Bay, I've, my whole life has been you know, around the oceans, the sea. I first went to uh, sea as a sailor in 1951. So what, 70 years, roughly? I'm going, anything that floats on the ocean, submarines, sailboats, you name it, icebreakers. And uh, it's been very satisfying. And then also being able to uh, contribute a little bit to uh, deep ocean exploration. And one of the things we like there, I think those, my colleagues and myself, is that the things that we designed and developed and used underwater cameras, lights, the first ROV, all these and underwater manipulators, mechanical arms that we used to do work on the seafloor. We did it all the for, for the first time. Not because we were precious or clever, but if you wanted to work, you couldn't buy this stuff off the shelf. You know, with only two of these man submersibles in the world, it's a pretty exotic customer base, for, and we were. So we would figure out how to do it, and get somebody to make it or make it ourselves. And today, I can see our f fingerprints or DNA over all the underwater vehicles in the world today. Most of them are unmanned. I mean, the, the future really belongs to uh, unmanned vehicles, the AUVs, the autonomous underwater vehicles, like drones, or uh, the remotely operated vehicles, which are controlled through an umbilical cable to a mothership. We've seen the National Geographic programs, these guys sitting in front of these giant screens operating a vehicle several miles below the ship. The manned vehicles, where I started out, there'll still be room for them, but basically the heavy lifting, uh, doing that 85, 90% of the world ocean we need to study, will be done by the unmanned vehicles. Uh, we, we can't finance enough classical research ships uh, to do that kind of work. It would take fleets of them. Uh, centuries to do that kind of work. But the AUVs, the underwater drones, you can program them to go down and do that kind of research work. And maybe we're talking about decades to do that, 95%. So it's kind of nice to know that you were in on the beginning of the development and evolution of these technologies and then could be able to continuously work in that field for uh, you know almost a half century. Absolutely. Uh, well, a life at sea, a life under the sea. Uh, Don Walsh, certainly a pleasure to have you. Thank you for this interview. Thank you. Uh, do your listeners know where we are? Uh, I'm definitely going to tell them because we're getting mildly tossed. It's not that bad. Yeah. I thought it might be a little more. We're sitting here in the basement of a National Geographic ship grinding our way through heavy seas between the Falklands and tip of South America. Yes, we this are. Is, you know, this is, it adds extra spice and flavor to your thing. It, we're not sitting in a, you know, Hollywood Hills in a studio or some optimum conditions, but we're, we're on a ship bumping around through fairly heavy seas. And uh, I think that adds a secret sauce to what you're trying to do. I think the secret is out. Meet the Ocean is educating the public by using the power of storytelling to engage and entertain our audiences. We are a listener-supported 501c3 nonprofit and are setting goals to release multiple podcasts a month 
accompanied by free educational material online. But to do so, we need your help. Check out meettheocean.org to find out ways to donate and be a part of our mission. And make sure to check out our Instagram, at meettheocean, where you can find daily posts that include photos and natural history facts from ocean critters around the world. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and rate and review it so that we can reach as many people as possible. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is Emily Pickering, an undersea specialist and frequent dive buddy with Mr. North. This episode of Meet the Ocean was edited by Andrew Gettings, with sound design by Kelsey Anderson and Andrew Gettings. Original music composed by Vin Gast, with production by Katie Steinberg and Paul North. Special thanks to Don Walsh, Charlotte Fisher, Leanna Fisher, and Dr. Deb Goodwin, and Sawyer and his mama for their contributions. And don't forget to check out meettheocean.org to find out more.